he has breakdanced and skateboarded on some of the most memorable commercials, music videos, and magazines of the late 80s. Hip hop, skateboarding, that's him in a Mountain Dew commercial. Man's got to know his limitations. Welcome to the Fallen State. I'm Jesse Lee Peterson. Today we're going to talk about your purpose. What is your purpose and why are you here on earth? I have with me Kevin Foster, an award-winning physician assistant and nurse practitioner. He is the author of a brand new book, The Gospel According to Ruth. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. I have to tell you, I voted on November 8th, and I tried to stay up and see who would win, mm. but I got sleepy and I couldn't stay up. Yeah. And so I woke up early that next morning and turned the TV on right away. Yeah. And they said Donald Trump had won. I went to cloud nine. So you're feeling good about that? Absolutely. You voted for him? Yes, I did. And why? Because if you want to cast a vote on the side of Democrats, then that means you're anti-family, you're pro-abortion, you're pro-homosexual um, gay marriage. And so it was a clear, distinct line, good versus evil. And uh, eight years of that other mess, see, Obama didn't get there on my vote. Right on. And the Democrats got out on my vote. When you first told me about that, I was stunned because, you know, you see, I've been seeing you around, I see you at different parties and events, and because you're black, I just assumed you were a Democrat. Ever since I've registered to vote, I registered as a Democrat. Right. But I never voted that way. <laughs> When Obama and his crew got in there, it was a burden on my spirit because yeah. you couldn't get any righteous acts or righteous deeds done. I know. That this country was under an oppression. Yeah. And when Trump got that victory, my spirit was, <sighs> yeah, finally. Free at last, free at last. Yeah. Thank God Almighty, free at last. Amazing, huh? Yeah. So let's get into your background. Uh, you grew up in Pasadena, California. Yes. And uh, did you have your father and mother together? No, my mother, I have, a, I have an older brother from a different father. And then there's myself. Yeah, he's a third in line, my brother, from the same father. Then I have a sister from another father father. Does that make sense? Yeah. Your mother was busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So were they. <laughs> yeah. The guys were. Yeah. So I did. My father didn't grow up with me. My stepfather was in and out of the house. Okay. You know what I mean? He was married to your mother? Married to my mother. Then he was out. But he wasn't. Then they got a divorce. Uh, then he came, came back in. for a short stint, then moved out. Wow. So, yeah. But my mother never spoke a bad word against my father right. in earshot of me. So what was it like growing up without your father being there? That's all I knew. I, I, didn't, I, I, would, I didn't hate him. I didn't right. have any animosities against did him. Did you miss him or did you want him there? Did you think no, about him? No, nope, didn't think about him or anything like that. Mm. I had a lot of strong uncles in my inner circle and uh, no, it, it just until I got, got uh, about 18, 19, I, I realized, oh, my father was a womanizer. Oh, he was over here, he was over there. But I didn't know this growing up, right. or I probably would have hated the man. If you had, had you known that. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. did you ever meet him? Did yes, you ever, yes. And what happened in that, with that? I recall being youngster in a, in a car and at a gas station and this guy would walk over to the uh, car window and my mother would say, oh, that's your father. And this guy look in the window and we look up, hi. Really? And then we'd just drive off. <laughs> but as when I got older, I walked, went over to the guy's house, knocked on the door. Hey, he recognized me. We sat down and we talked. So did you talk about the fact he was your father but wasn't there? No, no, you just, no. Would you talk about his life or something? Or no, just I just really sat there and just say, how you oh, doing? How's your family? How's your health? And uh, you went to a predominantly white school growing up, yes. public school growing up. Yes. And what was that like for you? That's all I knew. 
Did you feel out of place or anything? No. Did you feel traumatized that you needed to be with black people? No, we grew up on, a, on the side of town where there was a, an apartment house in a predominantly white neighborhood. And so we grew up around whites and that's all I knew. And so when you went around predominantly mm -hmm. black people or mm -hmm. black kids, mm -hmm. were you afraid? No, I wasn't. But there was a, on certain occasions, uh, <laughs> I'd hear the, the term Oreo. Right. They call you Oreo? Uh, once or twice, but they didn't know. How did you feel about that when they call you an Oreo? It didn't phase me at all. Didn't. I said, I'm, I'm doing my own thing. I don't care what anyone says. That's right. Yeah. Um, so you're married with, with uh, what, three or four children? Five. Five. Our wow. last one we adopted, she's 16 months. Your wife, is she a conservative Christian yes. as well? Yes, And she voted for Trump? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a good husband? Well, uh, there's none but good but God, but uh, I think I'm doing a fairly good job. I'm in the home. I'm working. There's a roof over our head. I have a car. My wife's a stay-at-home mom. Yeah. So I think I'm doing a fairly good job by the grace of God. And your wife look happy. You know, she, does, she doesn't look, meaning that she doesn't look like an angry black female. Mm. You know, mm. she look, especially having right, a right. husband, she look <laughs> like she's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just don't, just don't get on her bad side. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. yeah. She's a wonderful wife. Yeah. I, I couldn't how have you, gone this far without her. How do you deal with her bad side? Her bad side, I just keep my mouth shut. Oh, you do? There's certain, you know, I've learned in marriage, I tell you, marriage is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I can imagine. Now, I had a tumor taken out of my head. I had radiation treatment for a, a cancer. I've broken bones, I've fallen, I've, but, but marriage refines <laughs> the soul. And, I'm telling you. And yeah. why is that? <laughs> I'm a selfish human being. My wife is a selfish human yeah. being, but when you have children and you're living amongst each other, you learn to give up your old ways. So how long have you been married? 21 years. So you never cheated on your wife? Never, never cheated. cheated. Never, but I'm sure, Joe, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look upon another woman. Well, I wish I could say that, but I haven't. Right. You know, I've looked. <laughs> I've looked. But not cheating. That's good, man. Done. So let me ask, when you wake up in the morning sometimes, and you're all happy and fresh and good to go, feeling good, and then you up. look over at her, and she's mad about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you know, like, why are you so happy? <laughs> How do you deal with that? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up about 5.30 in the morning and she's knocked out. Oh, so when you come So home? this paint is different. I'm downstairs now and then she comes downstairs maybe with that yeah. demeanor. <laughs> Just kicked off about nothing. <laughs> How do you deal with that? How do you handle that? that? What do you normally do? In a marriage, you really learn when to speak and when not to speak. Ecclesiastes tells us there's a time to speak and a time to be So silent. when she come downstairs so, and you can see that look on her yeah, that she ticked yeah. off, you just I don't say anything? I look at her, I size her up and go, hmm, okay. You're like, Satan is busy, I should be quiet right now. I should keep my mouth shut. <laughs> and then I have to reflect, is it something I did or didn't do? <laughs> is it something I said or something I didn't say? And then you just let the day play out. Amazing. And gradually things are, you know, it's usually something I, I put the blame on me. Really? Even if you haven't done anything, you, you know, still take the blame? Well, yeah, or the children. We have five children, so maybe one of the children's done something. That's amazing. Does yeah. she do things to, to take you off? Yes! And how do you deal with that? Keep my mouth shut. You don't say anything to her? You know, earlier in our marriage, I would, uh, I would get upset with different things. And... Um, I would just keep my mouth shut. She'll walk around. What, what's the problem? Nothing. I'd look at her and say, nothing. Wow. Because if I expressed it, I'd go on and on and on and on and on. Oh. And I don't want to backtrack and say anything that was harmful to myself or her. So I learned to keep my mouth shut. But now, as this new season of our life has, has flourished, if, if she says something or does something, 
I'll be silent, and then she'll size me up. And I I'll, may say something, and, and we're back on the same page. You know? But how do you correct her? But that takes her, work. How do you correct her if you don't deal with her when she is in that mood? How would she ever overcome it well, if you don't deal with it? Well, see, you can't, when, so, when someone is upset, just, I've learned just, okay, let me just. Why they're up. upset? Yeah, just oh, okay. let, let some time go by, and then you could approach them. You know, because it's a it's a better method. You know, if someone's heated, you just you know, a soft tongue turns away wrath, right? If they're angry right now and they spit something out at me, then I'm going to spit something back, right. right? So I'll just let some time go by. Then we could approach it, and it works out fine. I want to come home. I want peace. I don't want to go to my job and butt heads. I want to. I don't want to come home and butt heads. So I'm always trying to maneuver my way. Do you avoid way. confrontation? I uh, yes, but I could. If you want to go that way, I you can. You can fist fight, but yeah. How about verbal conversation? Even verbal. Oh, okay. Intellectual. You want to go down? I don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>have an interest in life in that at one point you were in the movie business right yes I was breakdancing yeah breakdancing is the word I was breakdancing and um, even before breakdancing I thought about um, film and movie industry and um, I did a couple of plays but when I started breakdancing I said wow I could get into the industry this way and I was on Hollywood and Vine back in the day when they were breakdancing there, right. and I met an agent. And I told myself, I'm gonna dance, I'm gonna be the best dancer, and I'm gonna make money at it. I'm not just out here spinning on my head. <laughs> met a casting agent, and just things started lining up. That's so There's amazing Six to me national too. commercials, a slew of music videos. I remember seeing those videos and stuff, and those things, and I didn't know it was you. All these years, I didn't know it was you. One, you were in a Ape soup. That was a Sherelle. That was a Sherelle video. It yeah, was, was amazing to video. find out yeah. it was you in the suit. Yeah. That's something else, man. That was me. Clint Eastwood said in one of those commercials right. that you don't know your limitation. Right. Isn't that amazing? A man got to know his limitation, yeah. yeah. That was for And you uh, had none. <laughs> At that time, I had none. Right? <laughs> I saw you with a rock band or something where you jump into the crowd. Right. Oh, who was who was the band and how did that come about? Well, uh, well, when, when punk rock first hit L.A., I was kind of a part of that group. I had a friend who had a punk band. Um, we were going to all these different venues. You didn't see a lot of people like this at right. punk rock parties, That's right? right. And so I was showing up there at these punk rock gigs, and I was jumping off stage doing back flips and all that stuff, and that. That photo came out in L.A. Times. Black Flag was playing. <laughs> now, Black Flag is a legend in punk rock. And Dez, the second singer, lead singer of Black Flag, was on the mic. So that's way back in the day. Right. And so I was doing a huge backflip. And so I would get on stage and dance and jump in the crowd. And so how did you know the crowd would catch you? You, you just know it. You know, they want to, they're there, they're excited. Oh, I see. Adrenaline's running and they, they would push me up on stage and I'd get up stage and do my thing and then just jump in the crowd and they'd catch me every time. But I had uh, landed a, a Mountain Dew commercial, an Ocean Spray commercial, and things were rolling. I was in Screen Actors Guild, AFTRA, and... Um, I met a man, a medical, uh, a medical practitioner, family medicine guy named Dr. Herman Wright, black man. This guy, when I met him, I said, I've got to follow this man because he was reading the Bible cover to cover. How old had, were you at the time? I was probably 26, uh, okay. somewhere around there. He was the first one to really say, Kevin, you know, you're, you're body, soul, spirit. It's here in the Bible, right? And he says, you've got to learn to control your mind. He says, most men, minds are like ping pong. You hit it, and it just... Yeah. From one topic to another, you never can stay focused. He said, that's how your mind is. He said, you need to learn how to slow down, 
Get focused on something. Don't let your imagination spill up into your mind and vice versa. He says, every thought starts up here. It's a spirit. And then your flesh is going to act upon it one way or another, for good or for evil. And then he would show me in the Bible. And so I started reading the Bible more. And so you gave up everything for everything. that. Everything. I called my agent. I said, listen, man, I don't want to dance. I don't care about Hollywood. Well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to Africa and live with this missionary guy. <laughs> he said, you're crazy. People would love to be in your position right now. But I washed my hands and went over and stayed with Dr. Wright and his family. I came back. And then six months later, I went back with a friend of mine. And we started a film uh, ministry. We showed this film called Pilgrim's Progress around Liberia. And then we stayed at a Bible college for six months. Then I said, you know what, I'm gonna go to school. And I ended up, a reg I thought about becoming an MD. I really did. And I said, no, there's too many things out there I wanna do and I don't wanna spend all my time here. So I ended up becoming a registered nurse, a physician assistant, and a nurse practitioner. And so here your life is rolling, everything going well. Then you find out that you have a, a yeah. brain tumor, right? Yes. How did that, how did you find out about that? I was halfway through my uh, registered nursing program. And at the same time, I had teamed up with a Christian skateboard company. So we'd have school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Fridays, through uh, Monday, we we're off. So the team, the Christian skateboard team, booked a show one month in Pennsylvania. So we would, on Fridays, get on an airplane, fly to Pennsylvania, do these skateboard ministries, outreach, and then fly home. Right. Well, I was in the hotel room with my friends, and you know how a bunch of guys hanging out in a hotel watching sports and just messing around. And I have this sensation of millions of ants just this tingling sensation. They start here and it just seemed like they're marching all the way down my body. And I'm sitting here just stunned. And it slowly progresses down through my arms and I feel it all the way down to my toes. And I'm just sitting there and they're making all this noise and we we'll watch TV and I do this. I, I, I try to lift the remote control up to change the station and my arm went like this. And then I, I concentrated on the TV and I, my arm, I couldn't control my arm. I couldn't control my leg. And I, I said, hey guys, I can't move my body. And they thought I was joking and they saw this somber look on my face. I said, I don't know what's going on in my body. I can't move it. So we just sat there in silence. Right. And about a half hour later, my strength came back, and, uh, and you went on with life. I went again. on with life, and then it happened again. The next week, we we're in Pennsylvania doing another outreach, and it happened again. So finally, you went to the doctor. I'm in nursing school. I contacted the director of the program, and he got a CT scan of my head, and there was a tumor uh, on the side, and it was bleeding, and it was causing these paralysis. And so they did surgery and took it out. Three days later. And yeah. then you're going over life again, and then you find out you have lymphoma or something. About five to six years later, so I'm married now, I have children, and uh, I have a, a lymph node under my submandible right. jaw. And um, a friend of mine, a dear lady said, Kevin, by the way, her name is uh, CJ. She said, Kevin, What's going on with that bump under you? You should go to the doctor. And so with her advice, I went and got it biopsy and it came back cancer. Why do you think all this was happening to you? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a Christian first. <laughs> the Bible says hey, when that happened, also with the, uh, the tumor, the very, when, when they diagnosed me with that lymphoma and when they diagnosed me with that brain tumor, the thought that came to my mind was Psalms 119, 71 through 75. It says, it's been good. It's been good that I've been afflicted, that I might keep your statures. The laws of God are more precious to me than gold and silver. And I know, O oh Lord, you and your faithfulness have afflicted me. And it came to me. 
And I said, I don't know why, but it's for my good. And I just had to deal with it. So you didn't get depressed or anything like that? I didn't get depressed. Uh, you know what? After, um, after the, the tumor, I went back to school two weeks later and it was rough. And it was a hard time for me, yeah. right? But it wasn't a depressed feeling. It was just, I just knew I had to press through it. A, a burden of difficulty, yeah. but I got through it. And so when I had this cancer I was dealing with now, the same um, thoughts came forward in my imagination. I said, okay, I have to deal with this the same way I dealt with the brain issue. Yeah. yeah. And so you're free of all that now? Yes. All the cancer yes, stuff? Yes, but you know what? Job said, man is born of woman is a full day and full <laughs> is a few days on the earth and full of trouble. As long as you're alive, there's something that's going to come up. Did you your know health, that? Your health, your family, your children. Uh, did you know that uh, birth is a fatal disease? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs>Are we born in a fallen state? Yes. We as human beings will. Yes. So are we born like a sinner or does that happen at some other point? No. When Adam and Eve went against God, I was in the loins of Adam. And so are you. And so is everyone in the audience. We're all in the loins of Adam. So that sin nature is in us. I see children as being innocent. I don't see a sin nature in children, uh -huh, uh -huh. but I see that they are born into crazy families. Uh, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the parents, and mostly the mothers, but the parents tend to traumatize the children, mm -hmm. you know, passing their sins onto the children, being impatient and yelling. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the children become angry at the parents. And then they fall away from God, and that's when they fall into sin. I agree with part of that, but... Uh, Remember, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. Right. Remember, these children came, the disciples said, send them away, send them away. Right. Jesus said, no, no, let them come to me. Children, when they're born, they have the sin nature because they're from a fallen man. But if they die before an age of accountability, they're ushered into the presence of God. But within the home, that nature is exacerbated through crazy parents. Is there anywhere in the Bible where it says children have a sin nature? Yes. That's not in the Bible, boy. Yes. Where is that? Children have a sin nature. A sinful nature. It says, yes, it says, all have sinned. No, we talk about short. children. We do sin once we pop out mm -hmm. and into this crazy family. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, Prior to the moment you pop out of the womb, mm -hmm. do you have a sinful nature yes. coming through? Yes. Is that in the scriptures? Yes. Where? The soul that sinned shall die. No, you're not answering that question though. Okay. That's not in the Bible. That's made up. The, because children the, are innocent. Yes, they are. And they see things as they are. They don't worry. They don't trip out. They don't hold grudges until yeah. you keep messing with them. Yeah, I think, uh, well, let's see. All of my children, they came from the seed of a man. Right who is in the fallen state, right? Are you still in the fallen state? Not, not, not with Christ in me, oh, okay. right? But, 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 the, but so through my seed, they have that nature in them. But that nature isn't acted out when they're little, not to the degree of parents, you know what I'm saying? But it's in them. And if you let them go long enough, the vices in this world will draw it out. Are you the head of your wife? I'm the head of the wife, and Christ is my head, and does God she, is Christ's head. Does she know that you're the head of her? Yes. She's aware of that. Oh, yeah. I'm going to ask her what I see. Ask her. Ask her. <laughs> <laughs> ask her. You know, and that's a big responsibility. Yeah, it it's is. A it's a good one. one, though. Can you be a son of God, born again of God, away from Satan, mm -hmm. And still have anger? Yes. You can. You can be angry and sin lot. Is the Bible there, says be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Is yes. there love in anger? Yes. There is love yes. in anger? Yes. Uh, God. Um, but anger is not the nature of God. It's the nature of your father, the devil. And the devil has no love. So how would anger have love? Well, well um, 
um, some call it righteous indignation. God's going to judge the earth. And, and, uh, but he's a holy God, and he wouldn't be that holy God if he didn't judge, uh, uh, lay down his judgment. You know? I know, but human so, beings shouldn't be doing that, right? No, no, not human. Man, man's but angry people, angry people do judge. That's why they're angry. What was that? Angry people judge themselves and others. Well, yeah, angry people, and they judge unrighteousness. Right, so yeah. you shouldn't have anger there. Well, well you, you shouldn't. You sh Jesus had a bur uh, bouts of anger. Remember, he went through the temple. The Bible said he made a cord, and he started whipping the people. But, he said, my, my father's house is, uh, is a... But it didn't say he a, was angry, though. Yes, yeah. The Bible didn't say he was angry. Yeah. No. Let me, uh, all right, well, they I'll say he did that. that, but it didn't say he was angry. That's it. All right, let, let me double check on that one, Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> I'm less of an angry person now right. than I was over here. Right. And every day as I go, live, you know, it's like water off my back now. So let me ask, who is, what's your purpose in life? Well, my purpose, my purpose, I'm going to get to heaven. Right? <laughs> but God has... Uh, my purpose right now, my purpose is to raise my, is to love God with all my soul, heart, mind, and strength, right. and to love my neighbor as myself. That's now, a good one. doing that. That's a good one. That's huge yeah, because it, it encompasses everybody now, how everything. Do, how does one find his or her purpose? In the Bible. In the Bible. The Bible. God, God will show it to you. Let's talk about your book, The Gospel According to Ruth. Ruth. Mm -hmm. uh, Eight Seasons of Harvest, 121 Days of Devotion. Uh, what made you write about Ruth? And she's in the Old Testament, right? Yes. And yes. what made you write about her? Well, you, you know what happened November 2011? Obama was getting his stride, right? <laughs> his second time around? Oh, okay. And my spirit was so burdened. I said, you know what? I'm not going to watch any more TV. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to any more radio. I'm not going to read any more magazines. I'm not going to look at anything like that on the internet. Nothing. And now I'm spending more time reading, meditating on God. And so I'd like to read through the Bible once a year or at least listen to it. And Bible verses from Ruth started to open up like a rose. You read it and it tells you about different aspects of a family, bad decisions of fathers, bitterness from the mothers, uh, children making the wrong decision and marrying outside of uh, what ill-advised marriages and things like that. There's a lot in that book. Do you believe in interracial marriages? Yeah, what's the problem with it? What's the problem? Yeah. Have you, you ever dated a white woman? Yeah. Man, you know what? I thought <laughs> in my crowd, they... When I came around with my wife, all of them, all of my friends, they had said, a... Kevin, we knew you would either marry a white girl or a Mexican girl. But I, I told her that because too. Because you have that white personality. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> well, yeah, well, because I was skateboarding with the white yeah. boys. I was hanging out because that's all I knew. What attracted you to a black woman? Um, when I met her, I said, wow, she looks beautiful and she looks cool and uh, so she sounds man. cool and uh, <laughs> she didn't mind work. State. When you saw what happened in Chicago with the four black people attacking the mentally retarded guy, yelling F Trump, F the white people, what was your first thought about that? I guess I should go assemble all the other videotapes I have that are worse than this. Black on handicapped violence. Black people targeting old white people over the age of 80. All the violence at schools. These people are targets. Yeah.